Number 1. Sharon was abducted as she was in an alley behind her home in the 500 block of Virginia Avenue in Alamogordo, New Mexico, just before 3 p.m. on July 21, 1960. Two children who were with her stated a man and a woman drove up in a dirty old green car, possibly a dark green 1951 or 1952 Dodger Plymouth. They offered to buy Sharon candy and clothing if she would get in the car with them. When she refused, they dragged her into the vehicle and fled, turning west onto Fifth Street and disappearing. The abduction was reported immediately and within about an hour, police set up roadblocks to try and catch the green car at the Texas-New Mexico state border, but their efforts were fruitless. Sharon has never been heard from again. The male abductor is described as a fair and thin Caucasian man with a long nose and straight sandy-colored hair. The female is described as short and overweight with dirty blonde hair and eyeglasses, she was in her 30s. Witnesses reported that a woman matching the description of Sharon's female abductor had been seen in the neighborhood asking questions about Sharon, her mother and their home. Authorities believe the couple had been stalking Sharon for at least a week prior to her abduction. They had been seen after church the Sunday prior to her disappearance, accompanied by two young children, a boy with freckles and a girl. The woman knocked on a neighbor's door to ask about Sharon's mother, Lupe Gallegas. She inquired where Lupe lived and what her financial situation was, and whether she had a little girl, and whether she had a lot of children. The woman said she wanted to offer Lupe a job. It's possible that the strange couple had tried to abduct Sharon before her disappearance on July 21. Sharon's mother stated Sharon suddenly stopped wanting to go to the grocery store around the corner, previously, she had enjoyed doing this. She also got upset when she saw a green car and asked to be picked up and carried past it. At the time of her disappearance, Sharon lived with her mother, her grandmother, her aunt and uncle, and six siblings and cousins. Her father, a soldier, had left the family when she was a baby and she had no contact with him. The family was not rich, Lupe supported them by working as a motel maid. They had no telephone at the home and no one ever contacted them with a ransom demand. Sharon's abductors have never been identified and her case remains unsolved. Number 2. Ayala was last seen at a medical facility in Hawthorne, California on February 1, 2005. She has never been heard from again. She left her baby daughter in her parents' care. For several years after her disappearance, both authorities and Ayala's parents believed she'd run away. She had gotten involved in drugs while she was a student at Hawthorne High School, and she had a history of running away. In the summer of 2010, police found Ayala's high school identification in the Los Angeles home of Lonnie David Franklin Jr., the serial killer known as the Grim Sleeper. A photo of Franklin is posted with this case summary. Several of the Grim Sleeper murders took place during the mid-1980s, then the crimes apparently ceased until 2002, when they began anew. Franklin was charged with 10 of the Grim Sleeper murders in 2010, as well as one attempted murder. He was convicted of all counts in 2016 and sentenced to death. Authorities don't believe these were his only victims, however, they think Franklin may have killed up to 25 women. He died of natural causes on California's death row in 2020. Authorities found over 1,000 photos and several hundred hours of video in Franklin's home, the images depicted African-American females, both conscious and unconscious, many of them nude, aged between their teens and middle age. Investigators released 180 photos to the public in an attempt to identify them. Several of the women in the pictures turned out to be alive and well and identified themselves to the police. Several sexually explicit pictures turned out to be of Rolinia Morris, whose identification was also found in Franklin's home. The families of Catherine Davis, Rosalind Giles, Lisa Knox and Anita Parker believe Franklin may have been involved in their disappearances. Those four women were involved with drugs and prostitution, and they all frequented the location near Franklin's home, where his presumed victims' bodies were found. Ayala hasn't been declared a grim sleeper victim, but authorities continue to investigate her case and possible connection to Franklin. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Number 3. Virgil was last seen in a 14-foot skiff near Chichigaf Island near the Alaskan Panhandle on June 11, 1986. He had departed from Pelican, Alaska earlier in the day with a co-worker and a dog. His co-worker stated they had been exploring nearby islands before Virgil departed, leaving the companion and dog on a small island. When Virgil didn't return, his friend flagged down a passing boat. Virgil's skiff was located a short time later near Chicago Island, run aground on a sandbar with its motor still in gear. 
There was no sign of Virgil at the scene, and he has never been heard from again. Investigators believed he may have fallen out of his skiff. He was not wearing a life jacket at the time of his disappearance. Virgil is an accomplished outdoorsman. He resided in Highland County, Ohio in 1986 and had left his home to spend the summer in Alaska. He had planned to get a job on a crab fishing boat but ended up working at a cannery instead. He was a Boy Scout at the time of his disappearance and a devout Mormon, and he planned to spend his work earnings on future church activities. He vanished three weeks into his trip. There were several unconfirmed sightings of Virgil in the years following his disappearance. Witnesses may have spotted him in the Alaskan cities of Juneau, Huna and Sitka. Virgil may also have been seen on Montreal Street and Charles Street in Kingston, Ontario, Canada in March 1998. It's possible he may be suffering from total or partial amnesia. His case remains unsolved. Number 4 Naley was last seen in Westport, California on April 14, 2006. He'd gone there to pick up a truck. Neighbors reported hearing five gunshots fired in the vicinity at 2 o'clock or 3 a.m. His dog was located at the end of Howard Creek Road in Westport. Naley has never been heard from again. He was reported missing in May. Naley was often out of touch with his loved ones for extended time periods at the time of his disappearance. His two vehicles, a 1967 Ford Mustang and a 1977 Ford Thunderbird, were found in July 2006 in Westport. The vehicles were found on the property of James Jimmy Denoyer, and newspapers found inside were dated April 17, 2006. The Mustang wasn't running and there was no sign of Naley. A photo of Denoyer is posted with this case summary. He owned a 20-acre horse ranch and reportedly also grew marijuana there. Naley is a skilled auto mechanic and carpenter who occasionally worked for him, and Denoyer promised that Naley and his son could build a shop on his property. But Naley and Denoyer got into an argument about it shortly before Naley disappeared. Denoyer also has connections to another missing person case, that of Donald James J.C. Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh is Denoyer's uncle and was last seen in 2005 after he went to retrieve his belongings and his dogs from Denoyer's property. In December 2005, Mendocino County Animal Control seized 36 of Denoyer's quarter horses, it was the largest such intervention in county history. The horses had been severely neglected and were starving and without shelter. Police arrested the ranch caretaker and also seized four healthy dogs, three of which had belonged to Cavanaugh. The caretaker was subsequently released without charge and the dogs returned to Denoyer. Denoyer said he was unaware of how his horses were being treated and blamed the caretakers he'd hired to look after them. He was indicted on 36 felony counts of cruelty to animals, but at trial the jury was unable to reach a verdict. Denoyer is considered a person of interest in both Naley and Kavanaugh's disappearances, but he hasn't been charged in either case. Foul play is suspected. Number 5 Poe had two full-time jobs in 1990, one in the retail sales department at the Orlando Sentinel and one at the Circle K convenience store, now a Sitgo store, near Hall Road and the Loma Avenue in Orlando, Florida. She worked the night shift alone, five nights a week, at the time of her February 4, 1990 disappearance. Poe's boyfriend, Scotty Aggie, said men, some of them drunk, frequently bothered her while she was working the night shift at the Circle K, and he'd been concerned for her safety. A naked man came into the store about two weeks before her disappearance and climbed over the counter to get to her. He chased her around the store a few times and she ran outside and he followed her, then she went back inside and was able to lock him out. Iagi had begun staying with her during the night shifts to help keep her safe. He last saw her in the store at 1 a.m. the night of her disappearance when he came by to check on her. She was fine at the time. A friend who drove by the store at 3 a.m. saw her standing behind the counter. Between 3.15 and 3.30 a.m., a customer came into the store and saw a Caucasian man behind the counter. He was between 19 and 25 years old, had long black hair and dark eyes, and was wearing a black t-shirt with the Megadeth Rock Band logo and a dragon spitting fire, a skull ring on his finger, and a wire earring with a cross in his right ear. He apparently drove a black van with a Megadeth mural airbrushed on the side of it. He appeared to be the only person in the store, and the customer assumed he was the clerk. She wanted some cigarettes and had to point them out to the man because he did not know where they were. He said, you shouldn't smoke yakno, then used the cash register and made change when the customer made her purchase. This man has never been identified and it's possible he was just another customer, but investigators would like to question him and find out what he knows about Poe's case.
A sketch of the individual is posted with this case summary. Poe's store was discovered unoccupied at 4 a.m. when a regular customer found it unattended and called police. A cup of coffee and a carton of chocolate milk were on top of a stack of house plans on the floor behind the counter, and Poe's Circle K smock was also behind the counter, neatly folded. Her car was undisturbed in the parking lot with her purse in the backseat. Her paycheck and car keys were also inside it. There was no sign of a struggle at the scene, the cash register was locked, and there no evidence of a robbery. It appeared as if the store had simply been abandoned. Tracker dogs traced Poe's scent to the rear of the store, over a wooden fence and to a road, where they lost the trail, which suggests she got into a vehicle. She has never been heard from again. Investigators believe she was forcibly abducted from the store. Authorities said that they had a suspect in Poe's disappearance in March 2002, but refused to publicly identify the individual. Investigators searched an area of land near the Chapel Hill Baptist Church in Orange County around the same time. Authorities stated that a re-examination of the evidence in Poe's case led them to the suspect and to the area. It is not known if any material was uncovered during the process. Curiously, Chapel Hill Baptist Church is right across the street from Iaggi's former residence, and Iaggi had once been a pastor at the church. He has not been identified as a suspect in Poe's case and passed a polygraph test about her disappearance. He now lives in Kentucky. The police were never able to locate the naked man who chased Poe around the Circle K two weeks before her disappearance. Poe grew up in Northern Virginia. She took ballet lessons for 14 years and dreamed of becoming a professional dancer. She moved to Orlando in 1989. She purchased a brand new red Toyota and planned to buy a home and open a catering business in the future. She was sharing a duplex with a female roommate. Poe's father and older brother have died in the years since her disappearance. Her mother is still alive, however. Her case remains unsolved. Hello, hell. Number 6. Welch was part of the beat movement of the 1960s and was a relatively known poet. He associated with other beat writers including Philip Whalen, Jack Kerouac and Gary Snyder. Kerouac wrote about Welch in his novel Big Sur, the character he based off of Welch is called Dave Wayne. Welch had lived with Snyder and Whalen and attended Reed College, where he wrote his thesis on the writer Gertrude Stein. Welch moved to New York after graduating college. He began to have emotional problems afterwards, moved to Florida and completed a course of therapy. He then studied philosophy and English at the University of Chicago before moving to California, where he drove a cab while devoting most of his time to writing. He got involved in the San Francisco literary scene. People who knew him stated he was a very talented writer, but his multiple nervous breakdowns crippled his career. Welch was depressed and was drinking heavily by 1971. He was last seen on May 23. He was staying with Snyder in Nevada City, California at the time. Welch walked out of Snyder's house carrying a gun he'd taken from Snyder's footlocker. The gun is described as a stainless steel, heavy frame .22 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. Welch has never been heard from again. He left a note behind reading. I never could make anything work out right, and now I'm betraying my friends. I can't make anything out of it, never could. I had great visions, but never could bring them together with reality. I used it all up. It's all gone. Don Allen is to be my literary executor, use MSS at Gary's and at Grove Press. I have $2,000 in Nevada City Bank of America, use it to cover my affairs and debts. I don't owe Allen G anything yet, nor my mother. I went southwest. Goodbye. Lou Welch. Although Welch is presumed to have committed suicide, his remains have never been located. Number 7. Shannon was last seen at her family's trailer home in the 600 block of Plum Street in Thorntown, Indiana on October 15, 1986. She was playing a game of hide-and-seek with about 10 other children. At approximately 1.30 p.m., Cheryl disappeared from behind the trailer and has never been heard from again. An extensive search of the area produced little evidence as to her whereabouts. No one saw her leave the yard. Bloodhounds traced Shannon's scent to a nearby cornfield and cemetery, then lost the trail. The day she disappeared had been unusually warm, but that night temperatures dropped into the 40s. A Topeka, Kansas woman named Donna Lynette Walker claimed to be Shannon in July 2003. She telephoned and emailed her family, sending them photographs of herself and claiming to be the missing girl. Shannon's loved ones initially believed her, but the claim turned out to be a hoax, and Walker was charged with a dozen felony counts of identity deception and false informing. 
Walker accepted a plea agreement for the criminal charges in April 2004 and was sentenced to 18 months in prison after pleading guilty but mentally ill to felony attempted identity deception and misdemeanor false reporting. Ten other charges were dropped. She severed nine months in prison before being released on probation. In 2006, Jeffrey L. Sunnichelb sent a letter to the Thorntown police about Shannon's disappearance, claiming to have information on her case. Sunnichel was convicted of raping two children and sentenced to 50 years in prison. He has a reputation for providing credible information on unsolved murders, his tips to investigators lead to the indictment of a suspected serial killer. Authorities stated they plan to interview Sunnichel and find out what, if anything, he knows about Shannon's case. The child's parents have criticized the police for allegedly failing to adequately follow up on leads and failing to keep the family informed of the investigation. Shannon lived with her mother and younger brother when she went missing and was a kindergarten student at Thorntown Elementary School. Her parents are divorced and her father lives in Tipton, Indiana. Both her mother and her father passed polygraph tests and aren't considered suspects in her case. Her disappearance remains unsolved.